good afternoon students my name is uh, chani and i am a professor in the department of architecture and planning at iit roorkee and it is my great privilege to teach you modern indian architecture in this semester the word modern in itself is a very generic word because it simply means up to date for example if you were living in the greek times then the architecture of that period would be modern architecture so when we talk of modern indian architecture we are talking about the architecture of india today but as we will go through this first presentation of introduction we would like to actually show you what all we will be covering in this course and that modern indian architecture is actually a journey that begins before independence and reaches up to where we are today if we consider architecture in the world we realize that architecture is very has a very significant role in understanding human history there are many things that are very important when we need to understand history and buildings are one of them they are a reflection of a society of a civilizations belief systems their socio cultural values their economic structure or economic status their technological ab abilities etc uh, for example if we just look at the pyramids or the temples that speaks a lot to us about what the people believed in or the value systems they had during that time similarly if we look at the architecture of today then modern architecture is a testament to a modern world and modern indian architecture is a reflection of what modern india is so just as in the past architecture of the time is a reflection of what those people were modern architecture and in in continuation modern indian architecture is a reflection of what india is today so the study of modern indian architecture it will not only teach you about architecture per se but it will also teach you about your country as a whole and the value systems we have the socio cultural structure that we have or the economic status that we have the technological developments that are taking place today they are all encompassing within architecture but i'll take you back a little bit to one of the fundamental principles that have really impacted me as i have been studying about architecture i came to study architecture in the department of architecture and planning at iit roorkee in 1986 as an undergraduate student after finishing my undergrad in 91 i continued to do my masters and then i completed my phd and then i became a tenure or rather a full tenure teacher in the department where i used to study all over these years i have tried to understand what are the things that are vitally important for a good building design and one principle that has probably struck me most and of course there are many principles is that which was given by vitruvius now vitruvius as some of you might know was an architect and in a sense a theorist of the roman times and he wrote one very important volume of uh, of books called the 10 books of architecture generally all good libraries across the world have these books with them the 10 books of architecture by vitruvius now in these 10 books it is the only text on architecture that has survived since ancient times and it tells us about the connection between the architecture of the body and of the building the most important component of the writings of vitruvius is said to be what is written in this slide i would call it the vitruvian triad the three vertices of a very balanced equilateral triangle three central themes when we are preparing a building design and that is what he called as firmitas that is strength or we can call it structure utilitas that is about function so we call it function vinustas that is beauty or we can call it in our modern language form and aesthetic so three fundamental things structure function and form coming together in a very balanced manner create a good design now i'm not saying building design i'm saying design because this principle holds true for every product that you see in your daily life let me just take you to some things that might be interesting to you for example look at a motorcycle or a car this slide shows you that these three points are there in these all these products like a motorcycle has a structure as you see here 
this is the structure, this is the structure, I am sorry, this is the structure. This slide is showing you the various functional pump components of the motorcycle and finally, the form as it appears to us. Similarly, in a car, here is the structure, this is the function and then this is what the car looks like or the form. Now, the same principle is there in many products. You can pick up any product, there is a tutorial we conduct in our first year program where we give our students that uh, a problem that you can pick up any, any item, you can pick up a table lamp, you can pick up a table, you can pick up a, a chair, you can pick up anything and try to identify its form, function and structure element. How do they get identified? Say, let us now come to building design. So, let us take a very famous building of our modern times, the Haider Relief Center in Azerbaijan by Zaha Hadid and here it is the structure, the functional organization of the center and how it appears from the outside the form. When these three components come together in perfect harmony, when a building has an attractive form or appearance, when it has a very well defined functional organization and when it has a very stable and safe structural system, then it works together, it generally always turns out to be a beautiful building. You can dig up any building across the world right from the ancient times and you will find that this holds true for all great buildings. There is a fine balance of structure, function and form. You, it can be for example, the Colosseum in the Roman times or in our modern or, or later on in the Mughal times, the Taj Mahal or the probably the greatest house of the 20th century, the falling water or an Indian architect's amazing work, the Sangat by B. V. Doshi in Ahmedabad or it is Jean Hudson, Sydney Opera House, the one iconic image of Australia or it is the Burj Al Arab in Dubai or the India Habitat Centre by Stein in Delhi. All these amazing buildings, the one thing that holds true for them is the harmony of form, function and structure. This fine balance was seen in Indian architecture even in the past. When we look at our temples and the Chaitya halls and the Hava Mahal and the Buland Darwaza or the Sanchi Stupa, different uh, religious uh, structures from which they are coming out, dif uh, rather uh, uh, different religious systems to which these structures belong, all coming in harmony with regard to their form, function and structure. And then to the present, our airports, corporate buildings, institutional buildings, public buildings, houses, in this slide are some of the iconic works of contemporary times of India and they also have this harmony of form, function and structure. Now, why am I talking about this? I should rather be talking about modern Indian architecture or rather talking about that in India. Why I am telling you is, this is that this will form the basis of our discussion of the buildings we will study throughout this semester. We will try to see this harmony between form, function and structure in our buildings. Now, I am not going to, I am not, I, I, I would not be able to, uh, you know, say that we will be able to cover every aspect but we will touch upon various aspects to see how they come together in buildings. Whether function is just about the planning of the building or is it much more? Is it also about the services? It is, is it also about energy efficiency and uh, other uh, factors, other inf uh, that influence the design of the building? Whether there is uh, an integration of structure and form and function in a manner that we do not know where one ends and the other begins. So, I have started by mentioning this because this I believe is foundational to the understanding of any good building design. And when we study the progress or evolution of modern Indian architecture, this will always remain in the background. Now, the background. You see, when the British departed from India, they left behind an unfinished canvas as John Lang says for to reimagine and render herself in our own style. Up till independence, the Britishers had been painting this canvas and there is some amazing architectural work that they left behind when they left India. 
but the canvas was incomplete. So it was left to us independent Indians to complete the canvas. So this course we are going to study how this canvas was completed or rather I would say is being completed since independence vis-a-vis -vis architecture based on the needs of a young and modern nation since 1947 till 2022 today major changes have taken place in socio-economic, cultural, political, technological landscape of India and that has had a direct impact on architecture. Now modern Indian architecture per se is influenced by the diversity of our culture, economy, society and technology in modern India. There is also explosive population growth, there is rapid urbanization with massive demographic shift from rural to urban areas, there is of course the great uh, a big factor of globalization on top of it all and this is all resulting in fundamental alterations in socio, cultural, economic and technological landscape and thus modern Indian architecture which is a clear reflection of these fundamental changes. Modern Indian architecture as I said before is a clear reflection of these fundamental changes. So uh, and I like to say one more thing here and I am not trying to be controversial here. I believe sincerely that architecture is not a driver of change but it is driven by change. Architecture is not a driver of change but it is driven by change. When change takes place in our society, in our social cultural value systems, in our economic structure, in our technologies, in our materials, architecture also starts evolving accordingly. Of whatever little study I have had of modern architecture uh, uh, globally and in India, I have always seen a new change uh, rather a change in any of these things brought about a change in architecture. Now of course Winston Churchill is also true who said first we make our buildings and our buildings make us. So that is to a certain extent true. Recently I was reading an article where they said that in a, in, in a sense it is true with a limited window that yes the built environment can impact our behavior but to a limited extent. So therefore when we study these changes taking place around us we get a very good idea of what architecture we have in front of us. Rather when we will study modern Indian architecture in this semester, we will also be talking about these aspects in passing. They will be like the ancillaries we have to the main thing. We will look at some of these changes so that we can understand how these changes impacted, the kind of architecture that arose, why did it, why did it arise like that. It just did not come out of, of, of nothing. So why did and also in the end when we wrap up the semester, we will be able to look through the crystal ball so to speak and see that if these are the changes that are happening in these various areas, what kind of architecture can we anticipate in the years to come in our country. That I, I believe that for those of you who are going to practice core architecture that is very important for you to know what kind of buildings, what kind of building typologies would we expect in the years to come. Now let us take one of each of these points uh, just to look at it in a little detail, explosive growth, how explosive is this growth? 2012 we were somewhere around 1235 million, 1 1.2 billion people. We are expected to be, we are going to be, or we are touching 1.36 plus billion in 2022 and this is going to rise. But all that we see is that the, the, the speed at which the population is growing is somewhat, somewhat slowing down. The, uh, the other big factor which has a tremendous implication for architecture is rapid urbanization and demographic shift. The tremendous pressure on urban construction particularly residential construction. As you can see there is a rise in urban population. In 2001 our cities were occupied by around 250 million or let us say 25 crore people. This in 2011 shot up to some like 35 crore and will be touching close to 60 crore by 2030. 
that is a very substantial chunk of Indians will be living in cities or already living in cities. Now, how does it impact actual city, uh, when, when, how do the cities actually get transformed? Here is an image. How rural areas transformed or rather how New Delhi transformed, rural areas are transforming marginally, but the urban centers are transforming in a very big way. This is New Delhi in 1989, right? So, the areas near it, Bahadurgarh, Gurugram, Firidabad, Noida, Ghaziabad, they are all satellites, but that kind of strong linkage is not there. Now, look at the picture in 2018 and you find they are all the part of what is now called the national capital region. There is a tremendous pressure on existing social infrastructure and resources. Now, this kind of development has direct implications on architecture and planning. What is the changing face of our cities? These two images will clarify that to you. This was Gurgaon, I believe, uh, uh, you know, something like the 1980s, 1970s, maybe a little earlier, and this is what is Gurgaon today. This was Mumbai in the 1980s, and the same shot taken from the same spot in, in today, this is what Mumbai is, you know all over this entire city has come up in this, this vast conglomeration of these amazing amount of uh, you know construction taking place. So, what is the okay that, that is the aspect of urbanization. Now, what is the impact of globalization that is a global phenomenon on architecture in general not just India everywhere. We are that is transforming cities, but it is also homogenizing the built environment. Now, let me just take a breather here and just tell you one thing. I'll rather take a break and you know, just digress a little bit. Globalization is something can, we cannot, it is inevitable. The more we develop our technologies and systems to draw closer to each other, for example, the social media that you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you spend your lives in day after day, that is drawing people closer. You know, we are able to uh, very easily and very smoothly interact with each other all over the globe as one people. Therefore, this is here to stay. All the technological development over the past 20, 25, 30 years is leading, has been leading to this, you know. When the pandemic happened, for example, not only the negative impact that it happened all over the globe, but the positive part of it, the battle for the pandemic or against the pandemic is also a global fight. Similarly, other issues are, are now global issues and global issues impact local issues. So, globalization is just bound to happen with the way our world was going, but the negative side vis a vis the built environment is it has homogenized our built environment. It has left the built environment of our cities neutral and faceless. We do not find in them any touch of the local culture or the local flavor. For example, if you look at this picture below, I do not know how clear it is to you. This is an example of that one symbol of um, modern architecture all over, the tall glass and steel building. So, whether you look at Germany or Netherlands, Japan or Indonesia, this picture shows you it all looks so same, so, so similar to each other. So, if this was the identity of Asia, Russia and Europe and South America, then before globalization, this is what it has become now. It is all the same, right. Similarly, built spaces and buildings, they are not responsive to regional context today. We have learned to circumvent them. For example, climate. Now, today you build a building in the Middle East or you build a building in Europe or you build it in India anywhere. We can make this picture, this glass and steel building anywhere in the world because we can actively control the indoor climate of the building and therefore, we do not need to depend on the outward outer outward or the, 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 the external uh, climatic conditions. So, if we are in the hot Middle East or the cold Europe or the um, uh, hot and humid areas of other parts of the world or whatever be the climate, we have neutralized it. So, there is a disconnect of people from their built environment and from their regional realities. So, the global city, there is a visible evidence of this globalization. These are images that I have picked up from different parts of the world, Gurgaon, Mumbai, Bangalore, Singapore, London, Chicago. 
If you look at these images, they all look the same. In fact, sometimes if I were to remove the caption beneath the picture, it will be very difficult for you to sometimes capture which city I am talking about unless there was some iconic building that you know you remember that it belongs to a particular city. So, there this kind of homogeneity is there, socio-cultural uniformity rather than diversity vis-a-vis socio-economic structures and living standards, urban problems and demographic growth, building typologies, building materials, building technologies, for example, tall buildings in concrete, glass and steel all over the world. Now, the impact of globalization of mod on modern Indian architecture is pretty much the same. It has made architecture a faceless entity which is devoid of regional diversities with regard to climate, materials and social cultural identities. Whereas, what was required of us was to preserve this existing built environment, but interpret it and respond to it in a modern or a contemporary context. So, if I were to you know try to clarify this point, the above image is of that faceless entity, Gurgaon, right? any global city, but below in between this is a picture of a traditional courtyard space which has been lost. This is the regional identity that has been lost, but then you would say, but sir this is going to be lost because our technologies everything is improving, we cannot stay in the past, we have to you are right, we have to move on. But what I am trying to say through this point is that we can preserve this existing environment by interpreting it and responding to it in a contemporary context and that is one very important part of this semester that we will be focusing on, how Indian architects have responded to the regional context. This is an image of such a response, this is a picture of the British school by morphogenesis and it shows a modern day courtyard, right. It is a modern building, but it is the regional modern building. So, there is a reconnect between the user and his built environment. We will come to this point later on in this semester. Now, we see this uniformity in India through globalization, whether you are in Bangalore or you are in Lucknow or any other city, whether you are in these cities which are even tied to tied three cities like Cochin, Kota or Bukaro, they are they all look same, but traditional Indian architecture was not like that. It was defined by these variables like culture and climate and local materials. Let us just take the distinct identity of the Indian traditional house. So, we have the house in Himachal Pradesh, we have the house in Kerala, we have the house in Rajasthan and I believe this is, uh, I am sorry I kind of lost, I think this is in West Bengal or uh, similar uh, terrain. But what I am trying to focus on is the diversity of our materials and cultures and climatic conditions brought about a diversity of houses. Uh, and a diversity of expression of these houses. Similarly, the diversity of interiors, if there were courtyard spaces or any other kind of space within, each reflected the regional identity. But when we look at modern day housing in India, there is this uniformity under the label of globalization, whether in any of the cities of India and not only that, you can pick up housing in any part of a third world or even in the first world, barring a few changes here and there, they are pretty much alike. They are pretty much alike in the tire 1, tire 2, tire 3 cities of India that they are alike, whether it is a small place called Miraj where this particular apartment that you see here is proposed or it is in Kota or even in Hardwar or in Bukaro, there is not much difference not only houses, but even if we look at other buildings, institutional and corporate buildings, we do find that there is a homogeneity in some cases with regard to the glass and steel architecture, but, but there is a kind of an exception here in this slide because we do find buildings that are also iconic and they are not you know exactly reflecting that global facelessness. They are modern Indian buildings. This is another example in Pune. We will discuss about this also because both things are coexisting. Now, there are fundamental alterations that we will be looking at. There are these ironies in India, you know there is the slum on one side 
and the skyscraper on the other. The rich and the poor living in close proximity to each other. Then there is the coming in of the high tech and the green buildings. There is contemporary interpretations of traditional concepts as I just talked about a little while back. We will be looking at all these factors that are in this cauldron of what is called as modern Indian architecture. Again going back to the traditional Indian architecture, here we have this clear regional identity of a Rajasthani Haveli or a Naga hut in Nagaland or a Kartkuni house in Himachal or a, Na a Nalu Ketu house in Kerala. So then, is there a contemporary Indian architecture that stands out? See, this stands out. Each and every one of these buildings stand out. They speak to us of a people. They speak to us of an identity. But does this? Do any of these buildings speak to us of a region or an identity? It speaks to us of a global, homogeneous, faceless identity. In this confusion of styles and identities that shout out for our daily attention, is there something that really stands out for us? Contemporary Indian architecture is also distinguished by consumer capitalism that is replacing the decaying functionalism of a socialist city that was a part of the early years of India in the 60s and the 70s. So, this is a part of the socialist program and this is post liberalization in 1991, the global program, the liberalization program, the capitalist program. Pre-liberalization before 1991, Indian architects did respond in a wonderful way by reinterpreting traditional spaces in a contemporary context. This is an iconic building, the India Habitat Center by Joseph Allen Stein. It is tremendous connect between the user and his built environment. Here we have a courtyard space, but it is a modern courtyard. It has got a roofing system that is entirely modern high tech version of uh, a, a, a roofing system over this expansive courtyard. But post 1991 liberalization, we have an architecture of a consumer culture. There is endless novelties with features that are devised to maximize development, evade compliance with regulations, hide flaws and satisfy or satisfy whims of both the architect and the client. Now, I am not saying that such things did not exist pre-1991, of course they did. What I am trying to say is, today we see there is a literal boom of this consumer architecture in our country. So, should we reject it? Should we say it is bad and cast it in the dustbin? No, we cannot. As students of architecture, we need to study it. We need to find out what is good about it and learn from it. So, we come to the objectives of this semester's modern Indian architecture. We will be studying the evolution of modern architecture in India vis-a-vis -vis the three fundamentals given by Vitruvius, structure, function and form. We will be doing that by studying individual works of iconic architects to understand their design approach. Now, let me just, just take another step and tell you this, uh, tell you one more thing is, the study of modern Indian architecture, uh, it is not a, a history book study. I am not trying to go, I am not going to teach you history. That is not my, my, my objective. My objective is, Yes, we are studying this historical evolution from pre-independence down to 2022, but why? The objective being that we learn from it, we ga gather lessons from it. What are the various forces like point number three objective, the various forces impacting modern Indian architecture, upcoming concepts vis-a-vis -vis buildings such as energy efficiency, green buildings, seismic safety, software tools, technologies, etc concepts and ideas about various building typologies which students can directly apply in the design studios and that I believe is the biggest point that we have as an objective. That you can learn and apply it in your design studios, that you can learn it can become a part of your design thinking or your design process. This is broadly what we will be covering. We will be beginning with Indo-Sarsenic colonial and art deco pre-independence moving on to just about after independence on to modernism in India and revivalism. Then we look at western architects in India and their contribution, we look at the first generation of Indian architects 
we look at the contribution and the works of CPWD, we will move on to critical regionalism or regional modernism, then we will be parallelly studying about post liberalization era, we will be looking at contemporary developments, we will then come down to studying environmental consciousness and other factors related to that and finally end by the search for a new architecture in India. So, this is in general the profile of what we will be going through in this semester on the study of modern Indian architecture. Thank you so much for this time that you have given me today and I do hope that this will be a thrilling semester for both you and me. The, the person assisting me is a friend and a research scholar, his name is Farhan Asim. He, he is uh, supporting me in building this program uh, course for you this semester and both our intent is to bring it to you in a manner that will make you think, that will make it exciting for you when you look at the development of modern Indian architecture. Thank you so much.